That, that was quite a mouthful. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm just going to start by introducing American Farmland Trust because I'm not a professor. Um, I am from a nonprofit organization. Um, we're about 30 years old now. We celebrated our birthday last summer. And, and our mission is to protect farmland, promote good environmental stewardship of that land, and what now we sort of put under the framework of sustainable communities. The Growing Local Initiative that I am responsible for is really trying to bridge sustainable development or smart growth with sustainable agriculture and sustainable food systems. And so our motto is healthy farms, healthy food, and healthy communities. The issue for us is that a lot of American farmland and rural land has been developed, especially in the last 25 years. From 82 to 2007, which was the whole reporting period looking at this in the natural resource inventory, um, the US developed an area the size of Illinois and New Jersey combined. Um, one out of three acres ever developed in this country were developed during that period, mostly driven by everything that everybody's been talking about, which is inefficient land use and sprawl. So developed use increased by getting close to 60%, um, population only increased by just under 30% during that same period. And this has had a really bad effect on agricultural land in particular. More than half of the land that was developed was agricultural land, especially in the states that produce a lot of our fruits and vegetables, like California and Florida. And so this chart up there shows sort of the, the states that have had the worst problem starting with Texas that, that developed nearly three million acres. And as a note, they don't have zoning in Texas. And so I think that says some of, of why their patterns have been like that. Um, also California and, and, and Florida. Um, and then the states in orange and yellow are in sort of descending order of magnitude of problem. The states in green, I think, are worthy of note. Either they lost population, um, places like North Dakota and West Virginia, or they're really small states. And so when you look at the percentage of farmland developed over that period, what you find is smaller states like New Jersey, um, New England, especially southern New England, and Delaware had very high percentages of farmland converted to developed use or developed over that period. Um, and so those states in particular um, are concerned about finding ways to address these issues um, because there also tend to be the states with populations that care a lot about things like local, local food and local farms. It's not just that we've lost a lot of land and it's not just sort of where we've lost a lot of land, but it's also the quality of land that's been developed during that period. And the majority of the land and really the most pressure has been on cropland and prime farmland, which is really the land we need the most to grow our food. And so when you look at the acres developed um, for cropland, you know, it's 21% higher than pasture and rangeland. If you look at prime farmland, which is what states consider their best quality farmland, it's 44% greater than non-prime. And this is because, as some speakers have mentioned earlier, farmland is really easy to develop because it's flat, it's well-drained, it's often near infrastructure um, because farmers need to have access to markets. And so there's this sort of perverse market incentive to, that's driving the conversion of our best land. Not only what's happened in the past should be of concern, but also what's likely to happen in the near future. And that is that the farming population is aging and is aging faster than the rest of the population. And the group that's controlling land, that's growing the fastest, is the oldest part of that population. So farmers who are 75 years and older are the fastest growing sector. Farmers who are younger than 35 are the fastest shrinking sector. Older farmers control a lot of the land, about a fifth of the land in the country is likely to be subject to um, farmers retiring and going out of business. Um, and as you can see, the young farmers control very, like such a minuscule amount of the land that it, it's almost not worth talking about. Small farms are especially vulnerable. And for, for people who are not that aware of agricultural statistics, I know people think a lot about agribusiness, but most farms in this country are considered small farms, which means that their gross annual income is less than $250,000 a year. 
Um, most of the productivity in agriculture is in the million dollar or more farms. So the farms that are actually making money um, control, there are very few of them, and they control very little land. And the farmers who are most vulnerable to economic conditions um, and most likely to go out of business are the small farms, and they control more than half of the farmland in this country. So while we worry about those things a lot, we also look um, for hope, signs of hope in the system. And one of the things that, that does give us some hope is in that last reporting period, what we saw was that there was an actual decline. And this is for the first time since any data was ever collected, there's been a decline in the conversion of ag land. And it was 29%, which is significant. And it happened all across the country um, in 37 states. So something is starting to go right, and this was happening before the real estate market collapsed. This was between 2002, 2007, hottest real estate market, you know, certainly in my lifetime. Um, you know, whether that's measured by housing permits or, or projects completed. Um, and and what we think it's coming from is that the median lot size has shrunk, although I'm gonna have to check with Margaret after her presentation this morning, but it looks like Smart growth has had a positive effect on reducing the conversion of agricultural land. So that's, that's something that, that gives us heart and hope. Um, the other thing that gives us hope is that while, certainly from the, the agricultural perspective and the rural development perspective, the smart growth movement has really been seen as kind of an urban and suburban movement. Um, there's been a trending in the last few years to, to look at rural smart growth. And again, you know, I've said in the past that rural smart growth is kind of an oxymoron, but I do think that people are trying to look at rural development. Um, the, the incentives in the De U.S. Department of Agriculture's rural development program and, and seeing that if we could bring the smart growth principles that have been developed for urban and suburban communities to rural communities, that there, that, that might help. Um, and the Smart Growth Network and EPA Smart Growth Office have developed a set of rural smart growth typologies. Um, and so these six are those, and I think they're a way to help frame this issue and help understand what are the pressures on rural communities that could be addressed through smart growth. So you have things like gateway communities, which are adjacent to you know, national parks and kind of high amenity recreational communities. And they have a set of issues, um, you know, how to provide food and lodging to deal with a lot of tourists. Um, how do they deal with um, strains on infrastructure and often seasonal strains on infrastructure um, and the natural environment because they're attracting tourism. And then you have what many people I think think of as rural communities which are resource dependent, um, often home to single industries like farming or forestry or even mining. Um, they tend to have all their eggs in one basket and can get hit very hard by downturns in the economy. You have edge communities, and that's where we do a lot of our work, which are sort of at the fringe or the edge of metropolitan areas. Um, we call them urban influenced areas. They're often connected by interstate highways. They have access to economic opportunities and jobs, but they also have you know, a lot of the strains of development pressure and a lot of, of the inclination of developers to go after farmland for all the reasons that I've said. It's flat, it's well drained, and so on. Um, so that really is threatening the resource base um, in those communities and for the local food or local and regional food system perspective, those are ones that are in kind of an ideal situation for supplying those markets. Then you have Main Street communities, um, which is really where you have compact design. Um, we've seen lots of slides actually um, that, that show some of these communities often excessive to um, transportation hubs may have significant historical architecture, um, and there is a good community feeling in them, they then struggle to compete with big box stores and malls sort of being scattered you know, outside of their city or town limits. And finally, you have second home and retirement communities. 
I mean, they, they, you know, maybe pick up some of the attributes of these other typologies. But I think it's helpful when you think of how to apply smart growth principles to think of the different kinds of communities where those might come into play. The other thing that we see is, is a hopeful sign is the sustainability or sustainable communities partnership, also called an initiative, um, which is a collaboration between the Department of Transportation, Environmental Protection, and HUD, um, Housing and Urban Development, to coordinate um, the things that affect smart growth, housing, transportation, infrastructure investment, and to protect the environment in the process. Last fall, the three agencies together um, delivered or awarded, I guess, $400 million worth of grants um, and their incentives in those granting programs so that if you're working on one element like transportation, if there's a housing or an environmental component, you get higher points. And so the idea is to do more integration between federal agencies rather than to continue operating in the kind of silos that they tend to operate in, especially in their funding. We've been working a lot with USDA, the Department of Agriculture, um, because they seem like a really good partner and they are now an informal partner in this. Um, There's sort of a handshake agreement and I, I think that that also offers a lot of hope, not just for dealing with how rural development in some ways incentivizes sprawl, but also making this connection to the economic development and public health benefits of a sustainable food system. So there are a series of principles of livable communities, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read them all, but I think what strikes me is even though they are making an effort to reach out to rural communities, about the only um, I don't know what the right word, hand that they're handing out, you know, reaching out with, is the protection of rural landscapes. And I think that's where this agenda doesn't quite work with protecting agricultural land, smart growth in rural communities, and building local and regional food systems to, to provide sustainable food for the country, because the rural landscape in itself is not enough. It's not just open space that we need to protect. We have to protect the sort of vital infrastructure and capital of the agricultural system. And that is in working farm and ranch land, but not just sort of as a view or something, you know, to attract tourism, but really actually to, to, to be the basis of our food supply and production system. Um, but the good parts of it is that it's really working towards increasing more collaboration, not just amongst federal agencies, but also between federal, state, and local governments. And I, I do believe that that's where the answer is going to come, um, because a lot of this change is going to have to come from local communities. And if the federal government can incentivize that work through planning grants to give rural communities the ability to do this planning, that's going to make a huge difference. And the other thing is, of course, valuing the unique qualities of all communities. And to look at rural communities not as something that could become suburban or urban, but actually to, to recognize and value the unique qualities of rural communities that might actually affect smart growth in urban and suburban communities as well. And part of that is a real, it still is in rural communities to build community. It's just a natural part of the way people live in rural communities. It's very different than the way they live in a city. And, and I learned that actually through a snowstorm in DC. I live in a very small rural community in Western Massachusetts. And when we had two feet of snow and I couldn't get my car out and the plow hadn't come, the neighbor came by and plowed me out he didn't ask for money, it was just something he did because that's the neighborly way to do things. In D.C., if your car gets plowed in, nobody wants to move their car because they're afraid somebody's going to steal their parking spot. And so it's a really different attitude of community about sort of whether you share your resources as a natural way of living with your neighbors or whether you have to guard your resources because there's so many people competing for so few parking spots in this, in this case. So what about sustainable food? Um, it seems to me and the people that I work with, including a growing number of planners, 
that to have a real livable community agenda requires having a healthy and sustainable food system. Because food is as essential to daily life and, and as anything that we have, food and water, right? And then shelter. Um, it's important to our health, it's important to our economy, it's important to our environment, it's important to our culture. So it needs to be integrated into the principles of sustainability and livability. But traditionally, communities haven't planned for food. It is not something that planners address. And when I got my planning and policy degree, albeit at an urban university, there was no treatment of rural communities at all. And food and agriculture were completely outside of the purview of anything that we studied. There's now a food a, a program that actually does that at Tufts. But you know, 20 years ago, that just didn't exist. And this is something that's slowly been changing over the years. Um, until about five years ago, and then it took off in a way that, that was unimaginable, and it is now a very, very hot topic, and I think that it's driven um, by, by many factors, um, but before I get to them, it has its own set of principles, and I think those principles, if they could be brought together with the principles of livable communities and smart growth would really be the agenda that I think, at least I believe, we all need to be working on. And that in includes creating opportunities for local agriculture so that 91% of our farms aren't about to go out of business. Um, promoting sustainable production practices. So we're encouraging people to use good environmental stewardship in, in their normal agricultural practices. Um, and that's also looking at ways to connect with communities to create good markets for their sustainable products. It's building the infrastructure that's been really destroyed in the last 20 years because of the increase of the global food system. There used to be a lot more processing, whether that was milk processing, um, places to wash and pack vegetables, slaughterhouses, all those things have declined precipitously in 20 years, and it makes it really hard to build up local markets for local food and farm products. Um, improving community food security. Obesity has become an epidemic in this country, and it's very closely tied to lack of access to food in vulnerable populations. And those are in both urban communities and in rural communities. And the fact that it's such a per persistent and pervasive problem in rural communities, I think shows you just how confused we've become. Because you would think that rural communities at least would have the ability to be feeding themselves. And in fact, um, rural poverty and rural food insecurity is a huge problem. And if you look at Farm Belt, um, if you look at sort of a map of where you have the most food insecurity in rural communities, it tends to be very closely correlated to where there are farm programs and subsidy programs. And so this is something that, that has been driven both by markets and by policy and needs to be fixed. Um, you also have support and promote good nutrition and health, and so that's not just dealing with the obesity epidemic, but good health overall, um, and reducing waste in the food system. And I think all these things may be a way to achieve something that Mary Ann Borelli mentioned earlier um, when she called for the need for urbanization to come to value an environmentally protective standard of sustainability. Because I think that, you know, people say, you know, the old adage, the uh, best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And I think that people can connect to their environment and they can connect to their rural neighbors through food and in a really positive and healthy way. Um, but we have to create the mechanisms to do that. <coughs> There's been just this huge upsurge, and it really has been recent, maybe three, five, maybe seven years now, um, in local and regional food systems, and not as, you know, sort of as a proxy, I guess, for sustainable food system, but, but this idea that you don't want to be dependent for food on the rest of the world the way we've become dependent on oil. And I think we've sort of reached a tipping point of public interest due to a combination of factors, um, really starting, I think, with 9-11 um, and the sense that maybe we're vulnerable. Um, catastrophic weather events, certainly Katrina, but there's been flooding in the Midwest um, that's left people without food on their shelves. Cities realize they have one to two weeks of food available to their population. So what happens if there's some kind of breakdown 
and, and they need food for three or four weeks. Um, the spike in oil prices in 2008, I think in the next couple of months, we're going to see that pressure again with high oil prices coming back. Food safety concerns. I remember when there was the spinach issue a few years ago. Suddenly I heard all these ads on the radio about, you know, get local spinach because you don't have to be worried about it. Um, food deserts, which is this issue of food insecurity and food access, both in urban and rural communities, and of course the obesity epidemic. So all these things together have gotten people to say, this is an issue of national concern, what are we going to do about it? Um, and so there, there are lots of indicators for that demand going up. Organic sales are up, direct-to-consumer food sales are up. Um, farm to school is up tremendously, 950 programs started in 10 years in 35 states. Um, there's now legislation that supports that. A big movement on college campuses to source locally for their food. Um, there's even a Feed the Force initiative starting um, at Fort Bragg in, in North Carolina. So the military is even starting to look at this, people are looking at hospitals, prisons. So I think that as communities and institutions start to say, we want to know that we have a resilient and a healthy food supply, there's going to be a lot of effort to change things. And I think, you know, farmers markets are a case in point, just tremendous explosion of interest. Um, I worked on farmers market issues in the 80s, nobody tracked them. They didn't, the USDA didn't start tracking them until 94. And you can see on this chart just the incredible rapid increase, just 16% in the last year. I mean, it, it's taking off all over. And winter farmers markets, season extending year round farmers markets are also up 17% just in the last year. Problem is, demand outstrips supply. And so, we already import 44% of our fresh fruit, 16% of our vegetables. USDA says we need another 13 million acres of, of land in fruit and vegetable production just to meet daily requirements. Not to say people are eating all those daily requirements, but if we really want people to be eating a healthy diet, we can't supply that all domestically. And our population ex is expected to grow quite significantly by 2050. So solving these problems is really important and to me really has to be front and center in the sustainability, sort of livability agenda. There are significant barriers to meeting this demand um, and these are not barriers that tend to be addressed in traditional planning. Um, access to land and to farmland, there isn't enough labor so there's some economic development issues that need to be addressed, the logistics, the infrastructure issue, ag how do you aggregate, um, say, regional products for local and regional markets, um, and then legislation, the policy framework, whether it's at the local level, and that could be your town or your township, it could be your county, state, and then federal policy. It just does not support this kind of food system. Major problem is that our food grows in the path of development, um, especially in Florida and California, but 91% of our, our fruits and, and berries grow in urban influenced areas, 78% of our, our vegetables and melons, but even the majority of our dairy products, poultry and eggs. And so looking at this relationship between where land is developed and the tie to smart growth and then assuring a healthy and sustainable food system, you can't separate them. It's, it's all tied together. So what can we do? Um, and that's what I spend most of my time on, is not so much identifying the problem, but figuring out how to solve it. And, and I really believe that even though federal policy is important, and there are things that need to be fixed, really this is going to be driven at the local level with support from the states. Most land use decisions are made local, locally. Most public health decisions are made locally. Um, there is, you know, the role for the state. But change is going to require communities doing some of that planning process that we heard about in the last session, but bringing food into that equation. It's going to take policies, it's going to take programs, it's going to take pilot projects, Make sure we have land available, affordable, and kept in active agricultural use and in sustainable agricultural use to support agriculture and communities working together. And that means getting farmers who tend to be very busy, very tired, especially in the summer, um, 
and generally kind of introverted to get them out into the planning process to make a difference in their communities and helping people who don't understand farming to understand at least the farming that happens in their community. Um, and then to create and provide sustainable food um, for local markets and regional markets and a system to make sure that that can happen. And so this takes not just the traditional planning tools and traditional smart growth policies, but it takes planning for agriculture, not just around it, planning for food systems, using that planning process, which is collaborative and stakeholder driven, it gives people options, it lets them decide, help them support the agriculture and the food system that will make a difference to the people in their communities. Um, and so emphasizing farmland protection, you know, smart growth, keeping development in mixed use, you know, doing infill, keeping it in, in towns and village centers and in cities and off of sprawling onto the farmland and countryside. It's going to mean really watching how well we take care of our soil and our water resources. Um, it's going to take ag economic development, um, markets infrastructure. It's going to take looking at how to attract the next generation of farmers onto the land. Um, and fortunately, I see a lot of interest in young people, not necessarily young people from farming backgrounds, but often college-educated people who want to get into agriculture. So how do we open the doors and make that something that can really be not just a way of life, but a way to earn a living? Um, and then really addressing this food insecurity, food desert issue of how do we make sure that when we have enough food, we get it to everybody who's hungry and who needs it. And some of that, again, in addition to the kind of traditional tools that, that we heard about this morning, um, purchase of development rights, transfer of development rights, urban growth boundaries, those kinds of land use tools, we also have to look at how do we make the local environment friendly to growing food for local markets. And, and that's everything from nuisance protections, because many times people move to rural communities or edge communities because they like the view and they like the picture, you know, sort of the postcard. Um, but they don't realize that farming is a business and it can be noisy and there's equipment and it can be dusty and so on. So, so you have to make sure that, that farmers and their neighbors get along. Um, have to provide labor, farm labor housing, which also can be contentious because it may mean introducing people to the community who the community isn't otherwise familiar with. Um, and we know sort of from all the immigration issues that that can be very contentious. Um, but if we're going to grow a lot more fruits and vegetables, it's going to take a lot more people in agriculture. Uh, takes setback requirements, whether that's using cluster development or just having buffers between active farming operations and new developments. And then it takes really this sort of part that's about the business of agriculture and, and making it possible to grow food for local people on farm direct marketing, value added processing so that you would be allowed to make jams and jellies on your farm, that kind of thing, make your own honey make your own cheese. Um, greenhouses, a lot of times people want the open space, but they don't want the structures. Um, accessory uses and so on. And so it really is a community dialogue about what do we want to achieve? What's our vision? And then what are the practical steps we have to take to make that vision real? There are some very, very promising things going on. Just in the last year, um, there have been three plans that have been released that have engaged local governments in the planning process. Very new. We've been doing what we call planning for agriculture for maybe 10, 12 years now, but we're a nonprofit, so we work sort of, we often work next to the traditional planning process. This is actually the Delaware River Valley Planning Commission, which is funded with transportation money. They did this eating here, the Greater Philadelphia Food System Plan. Took, they did an assessment. They just published a plan last month. Um, heavy stakeholder driven process, really exemplary work. Um, looking all through the food system, from the farmers, from the natural resource management, economic development opportunities, food access, all of those issues included in this one plan. 
really, really great example. Central Ohio did a local food assessment and plan. Just their executive summary just came out a couple of months ago. Same thing, looking at farm, everything from farmland protection all the way through to dealing with the issue of food deserts. <coughs> Sacramento, um, they have both a food system plan, which was a little outside of the planning process, and then their um, Council of Governments, their COG, did this plan for regional food system infrastructure, again, to deal with some of this. How do you aggregate? How do you process? How do you get enough food um, together in one place to meet some institutional and larger markets to go beyond farmers' markets. And then a lot of state-level plans have begun to happen, and, and we worked a lot on this California Ag Vision. Um, Vermont just released a farm-to-plate strategic plan. Very, very exciting, hot off the press. Um, if you Google it, I think it went up last week. Um, and we're about to release a plan, a strategic plan for Rhode Island agriculture that again is looking both at the future of sustainable farming and also of the food system. So I think um, a, a colleague and friend um, has coined this term. I know you've heard the term new urbanism, but Sibylla Krauss from Sustainable Ag Education out in California has coined this term a new ruralism. And I think this is what's happening. And it's a place really where sort of smart growth, sustainable agriculture, and a sustainable food system all come together to, to create really, truly healthy and livable communities. And it's to create a framework of principles, policies, and practices really to bridge, bridge the gap between urban and rural, um, bring these things together, um, and and to what I like is this sort of idea of, of conceiving the urban-rural interface, which is really a horrible term, but it's used a lot, um, as a common ground instead of a battleground. Because for the whole time I've worked on these issues, and it's really been since 1980, um, there's been this real tension between how cities grow and how suburbs grow, and then you know, sort of trying to hold on to traditional values in rural communities, and, and it's a social conflict, it's an economic conflict, and we really, for the 21st century, we've got to get beyond that. We really have to conceive of our communities, especially rural communities, as places where there's sort of a food shed, a water shed, an energy shed, where there are jobs or opportunities, there are places where people can you know, live and work and play in a healthy and sustainable way, instead of this sort of the, the drive of the cities back out to the countryside and, and the exodus from the countryside into the cities. And it, it's been really uncomfortable for the last 20 or 30 years, maybe since, I don't know, maybe since World War II, but, but certainly in, in the time I've worked on these issues. And, it, and it's time to, to bring it back together and really create some common ground. And so that's where, you know, um, where we all can play a part in this. All of us can make a difference. Um, can start by knowing where your food comes from. And, and that doesn't just mean the food that you're eating, but it also means the food that you're eating wherever you're eating it. So that means, you know, where do your stores buy food from? And the restaurants you go to, where do they get their food from? Where does your school cafeteria get its food, food from? It's good to know. Um, and so then it's, you know, not just knowing, but actually consuming it, buying it, and voting with your fork. Um, and, and again, that goes through the whole system, every place that you can make a difference. But voting with your fork isn't enough. It's not enough to shop at a farmer's market. You need to vote with your votes. And policy, whether it's at the local level, where you're you know, voting in my town you know, for your planning board or your selectmen, whether it's voting for, you know, you have Rosa DeLauro in Connecticut. I mean, there's no greater advocate for, for both smart growth and sustainable agriculture in Congress. Um, make sure that you have the right elected officials at all levels of government to advance this agenda and make sure they know what you care about because they really do listen to their constituencies. Even though, and now I work in Washington, I think I can say it, you know, it may seem very broken what's going on there, but they still do listen and they do follow what happens at the state and local level. Um, and then finally, get involved. I mean, planning is a stakeholder-driven process. If you know that something's happening in your community, get out, make your voice heard, learn how to do this, learn how to use some of these tools, um, because really, you can make a difference. So that's it. That's my call to action. Um, if you have questions, um, the best thing to do is either go to our websites, 
or to call this 800 number. Um, lots of, we have a full staff, we have a farmland information center with um, four staff people who answer questions nine to five, Monday to Friday, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>